He is crazy and he is dangerous and he is unstable and he's obsessed. Probably he was immersing himself in some kind of fantasy world. This is not romantic love. This is not caring for a person. This is total control. He said to her, if I can't have you, nobody else will. And that scared her. Claire Bernal was born on July 25th, 1983. Her mother, Tricia, recalled how her daughter had always been interested in cosmetics. By the time she was 12, she was making her face out beautifully and she was always on for making up. Because of this enthusiasm, her family supported Claire's decision to study theater makeup at Shepperton Studios in Surrey. After her time there, Claire saw an opportunity to work for the Swiss skincare company, La Prairie. She immediately wrote to the luxurious brand to apply for a job at one of their department store concessions. Once she booked an appointment in London, Claire grabbed the chance with both hands. Adam Ward, one of her best friends from her hometown, accompanied her to the interview. He observed how eager she was to get the position and how overly prepared she was for this important meeting. And I remember that she, she had a portfolio with her and she just kept going over it and over it and over it to make sure that she had it absolutely perfect. When the application process ended, Claire was offered a job in the beauty department at Harvey Nichols in the fall of 2003. She promptly left Tunbridge Wells in Kent, where her family lived, and moved to an apartment in Dulwich Village in southeast London with two other women she worked with. Claire was delighted and proud to spread her wings and be independent in the city. Out to prove that she, she, she could be independent, but n not worldly-wise at all. She loved working as a beautician in such an upscale department store and was happy to experience an urban lifestyle different from what she was used to. Then, about a year into her new job, one of the security guards at Harvey Nichols approached her counter and asked her out on a date. Flattered by the attention, she agreed. Claire just casually mentioned that there was a man at work who, who was pursuing her. Like Claire, her suitor, Michael Pesh, was a recent addition to the Harvey Nichols team. Having been born in Bratislava on July 4th, 1975, Pesh studied and graduated from a prestigious Armed Forces Academy and served six years in the Army. He had initially moved to the UK to study English in 2003, but not long after, Slovakia joined the European Union, so Pesh was free to stay in the country indefinitely. He used this chance to apply his military knowledge in the security industry and applied for work as a department store guard. He was hired in the London branch of Harvey Nichols in 2004, where he eventually met Claire. Pesh was much older than Claire and was going through a divorce when they started to see each other outside of work. This was a big concern for her mother, Tricia, so she cautioned her daughter against this relationship. On the other hand, Claire thought Pesh was harmless, seeing him as a timid yet thoughtful man. The pair went on dates for three weeks, but the security guard exhibited bothersome behavior shortly after their first night out together. It was quite uh, a, a short period of time before he started to show signs of being very possessive. Pesh was overbearing and paranoid. He prevented Claire from enjoying life in the city going as far as forbidding her from spending time with her friends. He even acted as though some of her friends were in love with her, so she should stop hanging out with them. Claire also confessed to her cousin, Kristen Prince, that her new boyfriend had already professed his love for her after only three dates, and while they barely got to know each other, Pesh had already planned their future together. These actions all led to the woman feeling overwhelmed and uneasy. She admitted these feelings to her mother, even telling Trisha that the relationship was moving too fast for her liking. But I felt that Claire was in control of the situation. She wasn't falling for him hook, line, and sinker, so I assumed it would take its own course. Eventually, Pesh returned to Slovakia to visit his family, with Claire even seeing him off at the airport. While he was away, the cosmetologist took the time to think about their courtship, and she wasn't sure they would work as a couple. When Pesh returned to England, he pressured Claire into picking him up at the airport, even though his arrival was about five o'clock in the morning. The man also insisted on leaving a large suitcase at her place and argued that traveling around the city with something of that size was troublesome. He also demanded to stay over, which she reluctantly agreed to. Soon, Claire got sick and tired of all the antics, so she wanted Pesh out of her apartment. However, he didn't take any of her hints. It got to the point where the beautician accompanied him to the station so he could go home, but he refused to leave. Having had enough of him, Claire walked back home, but he immediately followed her. This pushed her to the breaking point, so as soon as she got to the apartment, Claire dumped his luggage out the door. Seemingly unconcerned, the security guard sat in front of Claire's rental for more than two hours. This was the last straw for the woman, so she decided to end their relationship. She texted Pesh the next day, February 28, 2005, to tell him things weren't working out. 
However, her now ex-boyfriend did not handle it well. He began bothering Claire, calling her upwards of 20 times a day. He kept sending apology messages and even bought her a bouquet, outwardly showing his sincerity and dedication to getting her back. Still, Claire was alarmed by how he acted the day before. She did not accept either and left the flowers outside the apartment. Once again, Petch stayed for over two hours, disregarding her wish for him to leave her alone. Her roommates had to get involved and let him know he was neither wanted nor welcome in their place, finally prompting him to leave. Thinking she had peace at last, Claire had no idea that this was just the beginning of the nightmare brought about by her ex-boyfriend. Even after the breakup, the two continued working together at the department store, which made Claire uneasy as Peck often crossed the line. He habitually followed her around Harvey Nichols and watched her through the numerous mirrors surrounding them, observing everything she did throughout the day. The security guard also repeatedly went to her La Prairie counter during work hours to beg her to get back together with him, but the mistreatment did not end there. Pesh dragged other co-workers into their private matters by urging them to talk to Claire for him, making things awkward for the cosmetologist at work. The man continued this behavior until the pressure got to her, and Claire finally decided to set things straight with her ex-boyfriend. She did at one point said, look, Michael, just stop this. Unfortunately, talking to Pesh did not make things better. Instead, it made his behavior much worse. In one incident, when Claire left work, the security guard followed her down the street. The man crept up behind her and grabbed her by the shoulders. He screamed foul names at her while asserting that he loved her, and she loved him. Claire denied such claims, but he continued shouting at her until she ran away in embarrassment. Humiliated and utterly frightened, the woman didn't know what to do. She was unable to sleep or work properly. She also tried changing routes on her way home and avoided Pesh hoping that doing so would stop the escalating behavior. But none of these worked, and Claire was at a loss, thinking she could do nothing to stop him. Despite her confiding in her mom and her cousin Kirsten, no one else knew how bad the stalking had gotten. I think Claire didn't tell me about Pesh because she felt embarrassed that she dated this guy for three weeks, that she'd let him into her life. At this point, the beautician considered reporting Pesh to law enforcement, but given that he hadn't done any physical harm against her, she didn't think she had much of a case. Because of this, the security guard continued to follow Claire everywhere she went. He would follow her to her place after she had finished work. Five weeks in, and things escalated further. Pesh started to threaten Claire, telling her that he would harm himself unless she got back together with him. He even warned that no one could have her but him. Then, on March 26, 2005, the stalker tracked Claire down at the subway and sat across her. He proceeded to intimidate her while she tried her best to ignore him. As she got off at London Bridge Station, Pesh followed her, even pushing her around. The cosmetologist confronted him and told him she wanted nothing to do with him, but the man was having none of it as he continued bothering Claire. Fed up, she told Pesh she would report him to the authorities if he did not stop, and in turn, he threatened her life. Claire and her family took his words seriously, particularly because they knew of the man's occupation and time in the military. They were well aware that he could handle a gun, and they didn't want to provoke him. So Claire kept quiet. She didn't go to the police and was at a loss for what to do. However, Claire's roommates were also Harvey Nichols' employees, so when they saw how bad the stalking got, they reported Pesh to their employers. This prompted the department store to observe the security guard, move him to a different schedule, and station him in a part of the shop away from his ex-girlfriend. Still, Pesh persisted. He left his post whenever he knew the beautician was around, and still went to her counter during her shifts. He even nonchalantly asked another Harvey Nichols staff member about the possible sentence of taking a person's life. Eventually, the head of security suspended Pesh, banned him from the shop, and prohibited him from contacting any Harvey Nichols employees. As a former officer, the head of security also encouraged Claire to file a police report and advised her to keep a record of the man's troubling behavior. This gave the woman confidence that she had a case, so she finally went to law enforcement for help. She stated everything Pesh did and how she tried to stop him. She also relayed how her ex's actions affected her daily life, with her having to change her number and needing to move to a different apartment. All of these were unsuccessful in keeping the stalker away. On the surface, the police took it really seriously. They interviewed Claire, took statements from her. Finally, on April 6, 2005, the department store fired Pesh and had him arrested. Two officers took him from the shop, where his former co-workers and Claire saw him handcuffed. He was escorted to the police station, 
where an appointed lawyer joined him. Pesh was examined by a doctor, who declared that there were no psychiatric problems at play, so detectives were free to interview him. According to him, it wasn't Claire who ended the relationship, it was him. Pesh alleged that she came on too strong and professed her love for him, so he broke up with her. He insisted it took him some time, but he had realized he felt the same and wanted to get back together. The security guard conceded to almost all of Claire's statements except for one. He vehemently denied ever threatening her at the London Bridge station. He also stated that all he ever wanted was to rekindle their romance, so he had no idea why she reacted the way she did. After this interview, Pesh was given a conditional release while police gathered more information on the case. Though set free, he was ordered to stay away from Claire and Harvey Nichols. These terms reassured the Bernal family that justice had been served, and they believed that the ordeal was finally over. Both Claire and I breathed a sigh of relief, and we really did think that the problem was over. Fortunately, that was not the case. Just four days after the restraining order was put in place, Claire saw Pesh lurking outside her new apartment. The woman was beside herself, so she called for law enforcement, who arrested the stalker right away. Pesh appeared in court the next day, wherein he was charged with threatening Claire's life and denied bail. This time, he was detained at Belmarsh Prison in Southeast London and released eight days later with the same terms as before, no contact with Claire Bernal. Following his stint in prison, Pesh vanished, and Claire was finally free from the stalking. The Bernals relaxed, believing Claire was protected by the justice system and their lives were back on track. On the other hand, Pesh returned home to Slovakia sometime in May. By June 8, 2005, he had applied for a gun permit. This had a rigorous process that included a background check, a certification from the doctor, and a practical exam. Because he did not have a criminal conviction at the time of application, Pesh quickly received a firearms license on June 14, 2005. Not long after that, he bought a compact, semi-automatic pistol and registered it with the Slovakian police. Pesh soon set out for London with the handgun inside his luggage and breezed through immigration. A few days later, on August 31, 2005, Pesh had his day in court. After much convincing from his lawyer, he pleaded guilty at the last minute to the charges brought against him and was ordered to return on September 21st for the pre-sentencing. This turn of events pleased Claire as a guilty plea meant no trial. She didn't need to face her stalker in court. She also believed that he would receive a light sentence, so he had no reason to get mad at her, and this traumatic event would all be over. However, Claire had no idea that the worst was yet to come, as Pesh's decision to plead guilty allowed him to post bail while he waited for the sentencing hearing. Then, on September 13, 2005, at around 10 minutes to closing time, a few patrons wandered about the London department store while the staff were getting ready to clock out of work. A co-worker signaled to their watch to inform Claire they would be off in a few minutes. In response, she smiled from her La Prairie counter and prepared to end her shift. I can never get over the fact he was released on bail. He managed to get through the border controls who should have picked up this man from his record unbeknownst to them a highly intoxicated michael pesh had just entered harvey nichols through the side entrance effectively avoiding the security personnel on the lookout for him when the stalker got to the beauty department a colleague caught a glimpse of his shadow behind claire and initially thought a date had come to pick her up but it was too late when they realized who it was pesh shot claire and then fired at himself shortly afterward after three weeks of casually going out and nearly a year of stalking, the beauty consultant's life tragically ended at the hands of a former flame. It was so surreal. Everybody was in shock. No, I pray that she, she, she didn't feel any pain. At that time, Claire's unaware mother was out with friends and had gone home late. At around midnight, Trisha opened the door to police officers, who then promptly informed her of what happened to her daughter. Um, I said... I said, it's Pesh, isn't it? And they nodded. Weeks later, in November 2005, the inquest proceedings began, through which the authorities looked into different aspects of the case. They investigated how Pesh had been able to cross borders with a gun in his possession, and explored how law enforcement could have better protected Claire from her ex-boyfriend. They learned that while the police officer in charge of the case meant well and tried her best to help, she had too much workload and little training to handle a case like this properly. However, it was concluded that Claire was unlawfully killed because Pesh had no prior convictions or any criminal records, so the police would not have been able to assess the situation adequately. Since Claire's death, law enforcement has increased training for stalking cases. They also re-evaluated their procedures, 
concluded that the initial risk assessment should be updated. They also proposed having the dangers encountered by those stalked continuously studied with the help of experts. Meanwhile, Trisha put all her energy into preventing others from suffering the same fate. Together with two parents whose daughters were also killed by their former lovers, the grieving mother set up an organization called Protection Against Stalking to raise awareness against stalking and push for a better system to protect those affected. We all feel that we are carrying on our daughter's battle and nothing will stop us doing that. Nobody can dismiss a mother who's lost her daughter. The women have supported projects such as the Family Justice Center, wherein agencies and organizations from different sectors work together to properly assess and assist those who have experienced domestic violence or stalking. Together with former Violent Crimes Unit Officer Laura Richards, Trisha also successfully campaigned to then Prime Minister David Cameron to change stalking into a criminal offense. To this day, Trisha uses her daughter's tragedy to help prevent such dangers from happening again. By 2020, protection against stalking has helped over 550 victims from suffering the same fate that ended Claire's beautiful life. Myself and other families do what we do because we really do think it makes a difference. If you are in the unfortunate position of being stalked, my cousin would want you to know, reach out for help. You've got nothing to be ashamed of. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.